Can everybody hear me? Yeah, I can see some nodding. Perfect. Thank you. All right, we'll take two. So I'm, I'm Sean Goodson. I'm a GP in Adelaide. Uh, and I'm a member of the Clinical Advisory Board for Better Medical, and I'm very excited to be here to host the first of the Better Medical Grand Rounds. And thanks very much for joining us, those of you that can join us tonight, and hopefully we'll have others watching the recording that we're doing now as well. So, as I said, this is the first of the Grand Rounds. So I'm hoping to make this a regular thing. And if anyone's got ideas for topics that they'd like included, we'd be very grateful to have suggestions and we can hopefully uh, cater to different people's requests. So today I've got with me Stephanie Daly, sat next, sat next to me, who's also a GP in Adelaide. He has a specialist interest in dementia. And I'll let Steph introduce herself properly in just a minute. But what I'll say is we're going to try and keep the mute on so we don't have all that echoing and background noise. But please do ask questions through the chat function. And I'll interrupt Steph with your questions as we go. And she's also happy to take questions at the end as well. So please do interact and, and let us know your thoughts or questions as we go. OK, and with, with that in mind, I'll let you uh, thank you. Them. Okay, good evening. Uh, so my name's Dr. Steph Daly, and I'm one of the educators that works with Dementia Training Australia. But I thought I'd just tell you a little bit of background about me. Um, I've been in Australia now for two years, and before that I was working in the UK as a GP. And recently I had to update my CV to do with this dementia work that I've been doing. And I looked back and realised I've really been working in the dementia space for since I was 14, I used to work in a care home when I was 14 and I used to um, prepare people's breakfasts and get them washed and dressed. And that's when my sort of dementia journey started, really. And then back in the UK, I also um, had some experience working with a geriatric um, psycho geriatrician. So I used to go to people's houses and see people who were acutely confused. And then I also was a, a GP lead for a dementia unit um, that was associated with one of my practices. And finally, just before I left, I did a course with Bradford University um, in dementia studies. And as part of that, became a GP lead at a memory assessment service. So all in all, I've had quite a lot of experience. And when I came to Australia, I was trying to work out how I could use that experience. And I found this organisation called Dementia Training Australia, whose aim really is to educate GPs and other allied health professionals about dementia to, so that everyone can be upskilled in it and and have the confidence to diagnose dementia and manage patients in the community. So I'm going to present one of their webinars today. It's a two part webinar um, and it's got a mixture of um, information about dementia itself and the symptoms and what you need to look out for. And then the second webinar is about um, diagnose, more diagnosis and management. So bear in mind that there are two stages. So we call it demystifying dementia because often people are quite confused, um, pardon the pun, about dementia and how to make a diagnosis. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thanks, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so the session objectives then are to think about dementia and to recognise that dementia is more than just memory, memory loss. And if that's all that you remember today, then I think we've achieved something. We're going to look at something called the inclusion criteria framework, which I'll explain more about, which helps you to understand the signs and symptoms that should be included to make a diagnosis of dementia. And then we're going to look at the exclusion criteria framework, which are the things that you can't have in order to make a diagnosis of dementia. As I said, beginning with the end in mind. So we want to think that dementia is more than just a memory problem. In the second webinar, we'll be talking about the MMSC and other cognitive screening tests. Um, and we'll also be talking about some management that we can do in general practice. So we're going to start with the Price is Right game. And I'm going to let Sean remind you all about what the Price is Right game is all about. OK, so I'm old enough to remember this. I don't know if everybody is, but it's a very silly TV show where there's a list of prizes and you have to work out which one's the most expensive or most valuable, which one's the least and rank them. All right. Yep. So we're going to do something similar, um, but using um, some diseases. OK, so what I'd like you to do with your if you can all see the poll is to 
tick the one that you think is the easiest to diagnose out of all of these diseases. And whilst you're thinking about that, me and Sean are just going to have a chat about what we think might make a condition easy to diagnose. Can everyone see that poll? No, no. it's not there. Oh, I haven't pressed launch. <laughs> <laughs> see, we have a slight technophobe leading, leading this. <laughs> all right, so we're just going to have a chat about it. So, Sean, what makes something easy to diagnose, do you think? Uh, a good diagnostic test. That's right. So if something has a, a simple one off test, it's going to be a lot easier to diagnose. All right. So I can see not everyone has voted yet. So I'm going to give you a little bit longer. All right. So. 90% of people chose diabetes and that's probably because we know that you can do a simple blood test to check for diabetes or two blood tests and then you've confirmed the diagnosis. Also the symptoms are quite obvious for diabetes as well um, and, and again influenza you can do a simple test for that. So now we're going to move on to our second second poll which is which is the hardest to diagnose. Um, so you want to get rid of that one? Yeah. Okay, so it's the same list you'll see. And this time I want you to no, let me know which one you think is the hardest to diagnose. <laughs> and when we're thinking about things that are the hardest to diagnose, that's something where obviously there isn't a test, just a single test that tells you what the problem is. But also it might be things where patients don't present as obviously or as quickly. So it might be a slow presentation, insidious symptoms, symptoms that cross over with other conditions. Or it could be that there is some stigma associated with the disease, which means that people choose not to present. So almost everybody chose dementia, which is obviously what we're aiming for. So now we're gonna look at the easiest to manage. So again, same list of questions. Which ones would you say were the easiest to manage? And Sean, what would you say was the easiest to manage? Not, don't pick one. And not one of these. The answer. <laughs> but just tell me why something would be easy to manage. Okay. So something like an infection with a an antibiotic that can treat it tends to be fairly straightforward and easy to manage. Yeah. And something that is self-limiting might be easy to manage. Something or that gets better on its own. Something I guess. that gets better yeah. on its own. Yeah. yeah. Or something where we have lots of evidence about the management strategies and we know exactly what to do. We have clear guidelines, for example, that might be easy to yeah. manage. Yeah. So a bit of variation here. Yeah, there's still good. Not quite everybody's finished voting. And I'm sure different people find different things easier or more difficult to manage based on their experience. Yes. Okay, so yeah, influenza and pneumonia, mainly because influenza tends to get better on its own. And as we said, antibiotics, it's a clear treatment option that we have for that. So obviously the next question is gonna be, which one would you find the hardest to manage? And I shall just launch the final one of these for now. And again, conditions that are hard to manage tend to be those where the care or management pathways might be quite fragmented. It's not obvious, you know, there's not one obvious treatment. There may not be an effective treatment that's available. Um, there may be lots of different people involved in managing that patient's care. So 
there might not be an obvious uh, clear guideline that we can follow. Patients might relapse. I'll give you another 10 seconds to answer. Okay. So this one, yeah, there's a bit more of a spread and that's probably because, as I said, sometimes the treatments don't work or it's, you know, it's just not that simple or there might be lots of complications associated with those diseases. So you can see people have chosen a few different options. But what we're really getting at is that Dementia is one of the hardest conditions to diagnose and also the hardest to manage. And if I just click on the, now this isn't just a random collection of diagnoses. This list is actually the list of current causes of death in Australia. Um, and what I want you to do now is to tell me which one is the most common cause of death in Australia at the current time. In fact, this is such new information that um, it's not actually fully out there. So this list is also the list of um, who in women as well, who is the, um, the leading cause of death in women. But it's also now overall just since like last week. Hmm. You have to be up on your mortality data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So the actual, I'll just see if I can click onto my next slide. So you guys put 36% of people said dementia. Well, that is the actual answer. Um, and as you can see, it's overtaken ischemic heart disease. Now this, when these slides were written, that was about women, but I know from some information shared from Tasmania that dementia has recently over taken the box. So yeah. see the slide. Yeah, has recently overtaken um, uh, ischemic heart disease. So not only, oh, why is that still there? I'll just get rid of that box and then you can see the slide of the leading causes of death. Why is that? I'm, not, I'm not showing it anymore. Um, bear with us, quick. I've closed it off. Uh, maybe move it right off the edge. No, you can't do that either, can you? Is it? Is that what everyone else can, can see? Get rid of it on mine? There we go. I can get rid of it. Oh, okay. <laughs> good. Thank you, Nat. You can see the list. You can see it even better now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. So, um, as I said, this is the list that's the leading cause of death in women. So it's dementia above ischemic heart disease. And the next slide shows the leading cause of death overall. But as I said, this has just changed, and dementia has just jumped ahead. So not only is it hard to diagnose, hard to manage, but it's also the leading cause of death in Australia, which means that we have a bit of a problem because if people don't know how to diagnose it and they think it's really difficult to manage, but it's killing more people than any other disease, we really need to upskill and learn how to deal with this because otherwise we're just gonna have lots of people who are not getting the right level of care. So how do we define dementia? Well, I define dementia as a condition which is made up of lots of different diseases. It's an overarching term that describes a neurodegenerative disease that is progressive and it was progressive over about 10 years, ultimately leading to um, death at the end of it. Um, and there are many, many causes of dementia. Now, most people are familiar with the commonest causes, which make up about 70% of the diseases, the 70% uh, of the causes, which is Alzheimer's disease and vascular disease. But as you can see, there are probably about over 100 um, other conditions that are under this umbrella term of dementia. 
The other ones that I think it's important to be aware of are Lewy body dementia. Um, this is important because when we talk about management later on in the next webinar, um, some of the treatments that we use can actually make Lewy body dementia worse. So it's important to know what you're treating. And frontotemporal dementia is important because that effect tends to affect the younger age group. So when you see somebody who's less than 65 presenting with cognitive impairment, you need to think about that as a, one of the causes. We also will come into contact with dementia associated with other chronic diseases that we see, for example, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease. Um, and I think worldwide, the most common cause of dementia is actually HIV, but that's to do with the prevalence of HIV in, in the African subcontinent. So for now, all we really want most people to concentrate on is the blue umbrella, the Alzheimer's disease and vascular disease. And often these can also be a mixed pathology. So that's called mixed, um, mixed dementia. And as I said, when we're talking about dementia, we're talking about it being more than just memory and it affects the whole of the brain and it's a gradual thing. So you'll get lots of different symptoms occurring at, throughout the disease at different times. And I'm going to talk to you a bit about those now. To make it a, a little simpler, because the DSM-5 criteria was so complicated, a, a colleague of ours at Dementia Training Australia called Jane Tolman came up with the domains of dementia framework. And so she breaks it down into five domains. So I'm going to talk, to you, talk you through these different domains. And these are, these are some of the signs and symptoms that are associated with dementia. And you need to have, you can have some of them um, at the beginning and some of them at the end and some of them all the way through. So firstly, cognitive decline. That's the typical one that most people are familiar with. So it's short term memory loss. Um, but it's also things like you may notice it, things like people forgetting their medications or getting muddled about their medications, not turning up for regular appointments. Um, and they might stumble across words when they're speaking, they might get to a word and not be able to remember what the word is that they need to say. Um, and it's a progressive thing. Functional decline really is talking about their activities of daily living. So are they able to do their banking? Are they able to do their cooking? Some people I was telling um, in the I did this presentation last week and I was talking about a patient of mine who came in last week and said, I went to see this lady and, and she said, would I like beans on toast? Um, and she made the toast, she buttered the toast, and then she got the can of beans and just poured it straight onto the toast. Um, and so she'd missed a step. So that's functional decline. If you something that you would routinely be able to do without a problem, you're suddenly or not suddenly, but gradually not able to do that process. And it's really important that you ask about those questions when you're asking your history. Now, psychiatric symptoms, we talk about psychiatric symptoms um, within the dementia um, process in terms of depression and anxiety. Now, depression and anxiety can predate dementia, so they can, um, dementia can mimic um, those diseases in their most severe form. So sometimes depression is called a pseudo dementia, but also dementia can cause um, depression and anxiety. So they are both sometimes predating it and sometimes occurring later on in the disease. And not only that, you also get hallucinations. And often people think that hallucinations occur later on in the disease, but actually I've seen quite a lot of people presenting with hallucinations. So sometimes people can misidentify their husband or wife. I had one patient back in the UK who had Parkinson's disease dementia, and he believed that he was living with two wives, a good wife and a bad wife. And he would get totally confused about which one was which. And at some points he thought he was actually having an affair with one of the wives, yet they both had the same name. So it's important, like, and most of the rest of the time, he, he wasn't um, affected by his dementia as much as you would imagine. So it's really important that you ask questions about hallucinations when people are presenting um, with cognitive decline. And these psychiatric symptoms tend to weave in and out throughout the disease process. So number four on here is behaviour changes. Now, these are the symptoms that I think people are most often familiar with or have in their mind's eye, if you like, um, 
people who are living in residential aged care facilities who are wandering or shouting out or aggressive. Um, and these behaviour changes occur later on in the, in the disease process. Um, and it's important to recognise when they occur and how they might be affecting people. And it's also important to recognise that when they are occurring, it's not necessarily as a consequence of the, the disease itself, although it can be, but it also can be to do with the environment that the person is living in. So if somebody has just moved into residential aged care, they have a lot of things taken away from them. There's a lot of depersonalization and then suddenly things are being done to them. And that can, as a consequence, lead to some of the behaviors that you see as associated with dementia. So they might become aggressive or uncomfortable about, uncomfortable about the environment that they're in. And so you need to look at ways to help them to be more comfortable and less agitated by finding out about their background and, their, and who they were. And finally, physical decline, which tends to occur later on in the disease as well, is when people lose the ability to walk, lose the desire to eat or drink, become incontinent. Um, and this is really the terminal phase of the disease. And it's important to recognise that there is a terminal phase in dementia. And, and it's really at this stage that we don't want to be admitting people to hospital unnecessarily just for fluids or rehydration. It might be that when they're choosing not to eat and drink, that's because they are in the dying phase of the disease. So then we look at the stages of dementia. Now, this can be a really useful framework for discussing with patients and their families about how things might change as you move through the disease process. People used to use terminology such as mild, moderate and severe, but we've tried to stay away from that kind of terminology because it's not really that dementia is ever a mild disease for some patients. It, it can always be quite a significant diagnosis and you don't want to be labelling people as, well, now you're in the severe stage or now you're in the moderate stage. So we've used terminology such as one, two and three just to give it a label. But it's not something where you would go from stage one one day to stage two the next day. But it's just a, it's just a guide to help to discuss with people about their escalating care needs. So stage one is when people are at home, they're managing fairly independently, but with a bit of support. Um, they might be struggling with some day to day activities, but with a bit of care or, or support from their family, they can actually be um, managing quite well. And it's important that these people are still encouraged to do their social activities. There's social um, withdrawal and loss of concentration are some of the key symptoms of dementia as well. And the more that you engage people in activities, the more likely they are to preserve their cognitive function for longer. When you're getting to stage two, you're starting to get even more cognitive decline, but also worsening physical and um, behavioural changes and also functioning. So they might no longer be able to make themselves a cup of tea or safely wash and dress. And it's at this point that you might be thinking about moving somebody either into a residential aged care facility or having more permanent care support or arranging respite for their carers if they're unable to cope. And finally, when people start to need more nursing needs, that's when um, they might need to transition into a, a nursing home. So if they need uh, assistance with feeding, bathing, dressing, or they're starting to have some of those more difficult and challenging behaviours that we were talking about earlier. So if I just show you the next slide, this puts those two things together on one slide. So you've got the symptoms, um, across the middle and then the stages on the top there. And you can see along the bottom that shows you the length of time that people have the disease. And obviously it's not the same for everybody. Some people have much more a rapid decline in their cognitive function um, and other people have the disease for much longer, but this is just an average. But it can be a helpful tool to show people this sort of diagram so that they can know what to expect and when it might be occurring. 
particularly for families. It helps them to get that sort of anticipatory um, care understanding. So they know, you know, if something happens, they understand whereabouts they are in the disease process or what to do about it. So I'm just going to talk to you about the inclusion criteria that we mentioned earlier. Now, these are the things that you need in order to make a diagnosis of dementia. So as we said, you need a gradual onset of poor memory. And it's important in this respect that you always ask people about how they were a year or two years ago. What has changed? Has there been progression? And with, with Alzheimer's disease particularly, it's a slow, gradual progression. Um, so it's always important to ask that and you need to get a really good collateral history as well because often patients won't have the awareness of what's been going on and sometimes I find that when you start asking the questions of people then it might be on the second or third meeting that the carer or relative comes in and says oh now you've mentioned all those things I've suddenly I've started noticing them all and now I think back I think they were there before so you don't always get the answers that you want from the first um, meeting. But if you're careful about your history taking, you will, you will really get some insightful information about that. So I often ask people, you know, can you still, um, you know, do you still get from A to B without getting lost? When you park your car and you come out from the shops, do you always know where it is? Um, do you look at the TV and sometimes forget the names of the, the people that you've seen on there for ages, you know, the same news reporter, have you suddenly forgotten their name? Or are you seeing people in the street and not remembering what their names are? Or when you're reading a book, do you come back to the book and have to flick back and read several pages back because you can't remember where you were? Or are they losing concentration and just not really focusing on things or not able to follow a conversation in a group? So those are some of the things that I, I find useful to ask. Um, so then I think that's covered the first two. And then, as we said, failure of function. So when you're thinking about this, you want to be asking questions like, when you go to the bank, are you able to use your PIN? Um, do you remember your PIN? But also at home, lots of people do home banking. So can you still use the computer the same way? Are you still able to work out what your direct debits are or even know who's what bills are being paid when? Um, are you able still to cook the same way that you used to be able to? So if you were previously able to cook a, a roast dinner, can you still cook all those elements and get them in the right order at the right time? Um, are you able to follow a recipe in a, in a cookery book? Some people forget skills like they used to always be able to knit and suddenly they can't work out how to do knitting anymore. Um, so these are all the things that make up the failure of function. And then cortical dysfunction. So dysphasia, so not being able to um, speak in a sentence. So this is your fluency of thought. So you might be talking in a sentence, get to a word and then struggle to remember what the word is that you need to use at that point. Um, some people who, for example, might speak English as a second language, suddenly start speaking in their primary language and, and kind of forget how to speak um, their second language. And then you have agnosia, which is when you have an object, but you don't really know what that object does anymore. So you might have a TV remote control, but you don't know what it is. Or the classic thing on the MMSC when you ask people to name a watch and a pen um, and they're unable to do that anymore. So with mobile phones now, people would you know, not really know what the mobile phone is or not be able to name the mobile phone. So they'll say, oh, it's the thing that you use when you need to you know, make, a, make a phone call, but they wouldn't be able to tell you it was a telephone. Um, and then the dyspraxia is having the remote control, but not knowing what to do with it. So you pick it up and you just don't know what the buttons are. So you know what the object is there for, but you can't work out how to do it anymore. Um, and when there's more than one educator here, we sometimes describe how you might demonstrate this in, in real time. So you say to somebody, 
can you show me how you um, brushed your teeth this morning? And somebody who doesn't have any problems with their cortical functioning would pick up their toothbrush, get their toothpaste, pour the toothpaste onto the toothbrush and brush their teeth. But somebody who does have a problem might miss out a step. So they might just pick up an implement and brush their teeth like this, but they haven't put the toothpaste on the, on the toothbrush. So those are the ways in which you can demonstrate those, um, those things. And then we talk about the exclusion criteria. So these are the things that you cannot have if you want to make a diagnosis of dementia. And you'll see that the top one on there is delirium. Now, often I remember when I was a house officer um, in the hospitals, we used to have patients come in and we'd write acute on chronic confusion and merrily go on our way. And it wasn't until I, I did a lot more understanding about dementia that I realised that people who have delirium, they have a low cognitive reserve. And that means that they're much more at risk of having cognitive impairment. And so although delirium itself can last for several months, like up to six months, somebody can have some confusion following, following for example, a bad pneumonia. After that six months, it's really important that you assess their cognition um, because it may be that 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 delirium was actually at the time they were presenting, they actually had some cognitive impairment. And that may be that they actually have undiagnosed dementia, but because it was acute confusion, nobody investigated it at that time. And it isn't, all, it isn't really appropriate to investigate whether they have dementia when they have acute confusion, but after it's settled down, and even if it doesn't settle down, but you've left enough time, say six months, you really want to assess it. So when you get a discharge summary and it says somebody had delirium, mark a little thing in your um, medical records so that you've got a reminder to bring that patient back at six months. And when you're thinking about, so that, that just should be a reminder that delirium really is a red flag for um, dementia. In terms of other organic causes, this is where things like vitamin deficiencies, hypothyroidism, brain tumours, you need to exclude all of those things. And that's why we do our blood tests, um, looking for, you know, any of those things that I mentioned, as well as diabetes, hypercalcemia, hyponatremia. Also a CT scan that excludes things like a brain tumour. So if you have any organic cause um, that might be causing the confusion, then you can't make a diagnosis of dementia. And finally, psychiatric illnesses. So as I mentioned before, depression and anxiety both cause problems with memory, problems with concentration, problems with social interaction, um, sometimes problems with speech. And so you have to treat those conditions before you make a diagnosis of dementia. Obviously, anxious people and depressed people get dementia as well. So you can't just say, oh, they're anxious, oh, they're depressed, that's the problem. You have to make an attempt to treat that condition as best you can. And once you feel that you've done that, then you reassess. The same with the organic causes, you treat the problem and then you reassess because it could still be that they have, once you've treated those things, they still have a dementia. Um, so, we're coming to the end or when you can ask questions anyway. Um, I hope that I've shown you that dementia is more than just a memory problem and that there's quite a constellation of symptoms that you need to be thinking about. We'll probably talk about the MMSC and other cognitive tests next time, but it's important to understand that they are not diagnostic. They're a screening tool. Um, and there are many, many different versions. I'll give you a heads up though. My favorite one um, is the clock drawing test. And also um, the, the other one that I find really useful goes back to that thing about fluency. If you want a really quick way of testing whether somebody has problems with fluency, ask them to name as many words as they can in a minute, beginning with the letter P. Um, and then you can score that to see how many they have um, answered. But basically, if you don't get about 10, 
then you probably have some problems with your fluency. And if straight after that you ask them to list as many animals as they can, beginning with any letter, um, and they have the same problem, then you know that there is a problem there with their cognition. And often people will say, they'll start doing it and they'll say, oh, um, police, policeman, um, uh, pencil, um, uh, did I say pencil? And so it's quite obvious that they're having a problem. If you or I were to list uh, things beginning with P, we probably would be able to do it quite easily. And then with the animals, often they'll start saying things like penguin and, and think that all the animals have to be listed beginning with the letter P as well, um, when actually it could be any, any letter. So that's quite insightful. And the clock drawing test, you get them to draw a clock and you get them to um, write the time at um, 10 past five. Um, and it's fascinating. Like if, if I could get a picture of all the different clocks that I've seen drawn. So some people will write all of the numbers just in one half of the circle, or they'll write all of the numbers round, but then they'll write like the digital clock in the middle. Um, or they'll write the digital one at the side, or they'll just write 10 and 5 and not put any hands on there. So, or they'll write like a really slanty clock, they won't be able to do a circle. So um, I, I think that's a, one of my favourite tests. And it's just something you can do quickly in your rooms to give you an idea as to whether or not you think this person might have any cognitive impairment. Um, so, and then the third one is that it's it's very appropriate for you to make the diagnosis of dementia. And I think we should all be striving to do that and all be thinking about it because there are masses and masses of people out there that don't have a diagnosis. And having a diagnosis of dementia allows people to make plans for their future. It allows them to discuss with their families how and where they want to be cared for. And it allows them to access medications which although not brilliant, do have some impact on their um, trajectory. And the earlier you start those medications, the more likely you are to see some benefits. And actually some of the medications also help with some of the behaviors that occur later on in the disease as well. So you want the diagnosis early so that people can access their planning, but also so they can access treatment. And also just so people understand what's happening to them, it can be so confusing to suddenly feel like you're really disjointed from everything that you don't know what's going on around you. And so if you can help people to navigate that process, then they'll actually have a much better quality of life. And so will their families. Um, we know that care of stress is a major, major issue. And so helping families to understand when they might be needing care and how things are going can also alleviate that stress. And as the GP, that's really our role to see the patient and their family as a whole unit. And I think that's it. So I need a drink. But if anybody, <laughs> I'm just going to have a drink of water. If anybody has any questions, then please. You can, there's not many of you, so if you want to like show me your faces, that would be nice. <laughs> but if you don't want to do that, you can just ask them in the chat box or whatever, or unmute. You can unmute because there's not many of you. Oh. So any questions? I mean, I've got one question. Yeah. Any, any tips around advanced care directives and having that conversation with patients? So I would say, I think it's really important to have that conversation with anybody. So not just people who have dementia or a life limiting illness. So I kind of bring it up as something before people have cognitive impairment. Um, but having a discussion about advanced care directives allows patients to have some control about what they what happens to them and where they get cared for. And particularly if they with something like dementia, you want to put in place things like, well, if I get a chest infection, then and I'm, I'm in stage three, then I would rather not have antibiotics at that point, or I would rather be cared for in the residential home. If I'm choosing not to eat, that means I don't want to be here anymore. And so I think allowing patients and saying to patients, well, 
I have this quite this conversation with everybody it's not just because you've got this disease that we're talking about it it's because it's something we should all do it's the same with power of attorney like everyone should have a power of attorney because you could get hit by a bus or have a stroke at any point really true well from now from, from my age <laughs> <laughs> true thank you any other questions feel free to unmute mute yourselves if you'd like to ask a question and just while people are perhaps thinking about that, there's also the chat box. I was just going to mention, don't forget that you can self log things like this for RACGP if you're with the college and um, RACGP points. And actually the website now for the college has got a quick blog function, which if you haven't seen, is very easy to use. So an hour of this is worth a couple of points. So well worth recording. Jared, Steph, do you have a Yeah, Steph, is there, is there any tips for uh, screening patients where English is not their first language? Ah, yes, there is. Uh, so for that's I think that's coming up in the next okay. webinar but I'm yeah there are so I'm also doing another webinar for uh, the read group about culturally and linguistically diverse um, groups and as part of that I was looking at different screening tools um, so there's the Kika which is um, for the indigenous Australians but there is there are also some that have been translated into um, various languages and then the Mocha as well can sometimes be used um, but it isn't there aren't that many and it is quite difficult um, particularly if there's a language barrier you can't always ask all of these questions in the same way but there are a few out there yeah. Okay, I've got another question here. How can our nursing colleagues be best supported to keep this on their radar as they often do care plans and the health assessments? Yes, um, and I think, I think, well, what I did, <laughs> which I still think I would recommend, is I educated, uh, I got all of the reception staff and the nursing staff to become dementia friends with Dementia Australia. And I think that educating your reception staff is also really important because they can often be the people that come into contact with patients who say, oh, they've forgotten their appointment or they've lost their prescription. And so everybody in the practice really needs to be aware of dementia because all, every single one of us could come into contact with somebody who might have it, who might not have a diagnosis. And with the nurses, I think it's giving them the confidence to ask the questions. So even just asking, you know, in the like in our section of our over 75s, we do have the MMSC as part of it. But also just asking patients, are you concerned about your memory? Do you have any concerns? Has anyone else ever said they have any concerns about their memory? about your memory and that should just be a say that we ask this routinely for all of our patients but it's just something that we're doing just because it's part of your health care and I think there should be a section on on all of our care plans now about cognitive health because so much of uh, dementia is going going to be such a big problem with patients having cardiovascular disease and diabetes all of those things put you at increased risk of dementia and so it should just be part of part of everything your brain is another organ that we really don't pay any attention to so we should just be asking it routinely so instilling confidence spreading the message reducing stigma and increasing awareness about dementia in your practice is what i would suggest brilliant any other questions well i'd like to say oh sorry oh. One from the other side. <laughs> Hi, Steph. Um, just wondering about the screening tools that um, are available. Yeah. Are you going to be discussing those in your next yes. one? Yes. Okay. So I'll do the screening tools and um, the management in the next one. Great. All right. No, that's good. Thanks. Did you have another question? No. Uh, well, thank you very much, Steph. That was absolutely fantastic. Uh, we'd be very grateful for any feedback. Um, feel free to email anything through. And also, as I said before, any suggestions for other topics topics, sorry, in the future would be great as well. And thank you very much to everybody for joining us tonight.